This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with coach and lecturer at the University of Winchester, Richard Cheatham. He discusses some coach development tips and how he works to improve coaches as practitioners, his thoughts about why being creative and unique as a coach is important, as well as his vehement belief in why we should encourage children to take ownership of their environment. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. So Richard, really excited for this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on. How are things in your world? Are you all good? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, busy with lots of exciting projects and just finished uh, the academic year and then start starting working with a few other um, additional projects I'm involved with and, and also not forgetting to enjoy the summer holiday. Yeah, as you said, you've got to have a little bit of uh, summer holiday time, a bit of family time, etc. as well. So, yeah, don't blame you for that. I've just, I'm in the middle of our off season coming through to now get back up. So, I've definitely gone out and played a few rounds of golf and, and lost a few golf balls and stuff, which has been very <laughs> enjoyable. Although, I'm not sure I should be enjoying losing golf balls. But uh, for people that maybe haven't come across you, um, do you just want to give us a bit of an oversight of who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I... Um... Senior Fellow and Sports Coach at the University of Winchester. I've been there uh, quite, quite a long time now, but alongside my coaching degree, which I teach on, I'm also a coach developer, coach educator um, through with England Rugby. I also work with World Cycling in Switzerland, um, and I'm currently working with British Fencing and also with Great Britain Wheelchair Rugby on different projects. So my work, whilst it is predominantly at the university, is at as a, as a lecturer, um, I also do quite a bit of external work with different sports and different environments. Perfect. So, yeah, I think it will give us a really nice oversight into a variety of areas. I think first thing, uh, first things first, how did you get into coach development or how did you get into coaching? Yeah, what, what did that look like for you? Well, it just goes back to the conversation we had before we started the recording, really. I, I was teaching uh, in New Zealand. I'm a, I'm a sort of postgraduate with sports science and I moved to New Zealand and taught on a science, sports science and coaching degree. And it was when I got involved in the coaching side of it, that I, I just enjoyed it much more. I felt a lot more, um, I just related to a lot more. I, I was coaching a, one of the teams in the, in the area and I just was drawn towards that more than I was drawn to the sports science. So I thought that human, human interaction and developing players and the relationships with players and the, the options, just the environment, I just found really was an area where I flourished more than sports science. Perfect. I think that, yeah, what I've learned a lot of uh, a lot about people in here is quite often that initial labour of love or kind of going down a pathway that just intrigued them is something that um, really resonates and it seems similar uh, to yourself there. In terms of, um, I guess, coach development, coaching, what would you say are some of your key principles or key beliefs around um yeah the coaching space i think there is a tendency to miss really what is evident in front of us that it is ultimately about people and you'll hear this over and over again in research articles in players when they're talking about the coach they've just worked with it's the interaction the relationship you build with players and and I, and I would say it doesn't mean we ignore the tactical and technical knowledge that we have as a coach and understanding of that. But the priority is the, that connection that we build with those people who we are developing, coaching, taking through, you know, difficult uh, times. Um, I say difficult, either defeat, injury, development, struggle with learning. But if you have that rapport and relationship with somebody, it's a much stronger um, bond than, than sometimes people realise above what you may know of the game. And when when we're looking at the literature which you referenced there, where from your experience did that begin to come paramount that actually the coach athlete relationship or the sporting environment should be focused on, you know, person first, maybe rather than tech tap first? I suppose it didn't initially come from any particular research, it just came from 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 teaching. And I found that 
teaching in, te teaching in a technical college and teaching in New Zealand and then coming back to, to the UK and on to university, it was, you know, you see people at uh, different stages of life, different backgrounds, different journeys to get to, to when they are with you and then um, the, the challenges along the way, not always challenges, lots of positives as well, is that part of your intuition is is developed around the individual needs that, that people have. And, um, and then obviously once you sort of make that part of your coaching and teaching uh, DNA or identity, then you start to explore how that is portrayed in, in other teams. I spent a lot of time with uh, age group rugby with England um, where you saw those um, different environments, different coaches. And then obviously then you start on your research journey and I did some work around captaincy and professional rugby and, you know, two, one particular instance stood out that it was the co it, it was the captain off the field uh, rather than or, as well as the captain on the field and what that uh, interview one of the interviews showed me was that it was the relationships that that captain had with his players over and above the the kind of battleground of the match and then obviously just working in different other settings um and reading and researching and watching a lot of work around Sophia Jowett, who at Loughborough has done a lot of work on coach-athlete relationships, talking to other coaches, watching things happen, watch my daughter's relationship with her coach, her teachers. You know, it just reinforces all the beliefs that you have, have gained along the way. I'm, I'm going to come back to a professional question here, but just on a personal one, how challenging is it for you to watch I guess from um, a parent and point of view uh, your kids be coached I know from speaking to a few colleagues of mine they do find it difficult at points if you've got someone who's either new on their journey or maybe does it in a way that would be different the, the way you do it you're kind of squirming in your seat a little bit is that something that you that resonates with you or have you been fortunate in some of the interactions that you've had with um with your daughter and and her coaching environments, etc. Well, am I probably am the worst parent on the side sideline um, because you know I, I I see things, I know things, I watch things play out in front of me. Um, and the first time my daughter went to a a, a session, you know, my partner at the time said he's a great coach, and I I just couldn't see that, and I had to sort of explain that just knowing my daughter's name was not enough in that hour and then but um in fairness many voluntary coaches and coaches are doing it out of goodwill and sometimes it's they're not knowing not through intention um but the person who voted with their feet was my daughter and um you know she knew she knew what she enjoyed what made her tick and what good coaching was about so it wasn't difficult um I wasn't it trying to extract it from a situation where I'm thinking this isn't really very good because she was able to say to me, look, I'm not enjoying that and feel able to do so. Um, and uh, it is difficult, I think, but not always, you know, it's good and bad in, in, in everything. And bad is generally, I, I generally say it is through coaches not knowing, not through not wanting to, to learn and develop. Yeah, and the, the thing that I so I just did bit into that but when I do my level two with it with the RFU, as an example, many of the people on that course are volunteer coaches, parents who are new to coaching. And it's a breath of sigh of relief when they realize that they're not validated on their technical knowledge. It's about the rapport they build with the people they teach. And reinforcing that is you know is a really uh, great moment when you see them understand that that it is not about their playing experience and their playing knowledge it's, it's sometimes much more important than, than that yeah I think that I think that's something that's been a real positive I've seen over the last you know 10 years of a move away from it just being tech deck and discussing those coach athletes relationship was obviously really important um, I guess from from your point of view, how do you um, 
challenge behaviors that may be that the children like that but that might not be useful in the long term um or so example i could give if if you make the same kid captain every single week that kid's probably going to maybe have a good relationship with the coach because he feels like getting special treatment but that mm. might not be the most useful thing for that child in terms of preparing them to to share or understanding their role within the team or whatever that may be so do you try and challenge those behaviors or is that just something you kind of step back from and say that's outside of my remit because I don't know the context fully all that type of stuff well, in, in terms of environments, you know, there, there's some some of the things that really I try to I, I highlight in in the coach development work and in my teaching is the art of noticing. And the noticing is that within in front of you is a group of children or adults, and a special treatment comes when you are constantly reinforcing the positives of of a smaller member of the group you know the hierarchy the, the the more competent people and ignoring those in front of you who are also achieving but not maybe to the level of those at the other end of that sort of spectrum so the art of noticing it, it is really important in making everybody you you coach feels that they are achieving that they are being seen they're being you're attentive to their performance in their training or their their matches or their learning and so it's not so much around the leadership um, role you give someone. It's actually about the attention you give the whole group. You know, there is the biggest challenge in coaching that I believe is differentiation. How can we coach a mixed ability group and make everybody feel there in the right environment, in the right place and achieving, even though you've got really very competent, experienced ones and ones who may be novices. And it's that that mix of people that, that is the challenge for coaches, I think. And in your experience with the either yourself or the practitioners you work with, how have the most skillful people been able to do that? I think differentiation is a really nice example because it doesn't matter who's listening to this podcast or who you're working with. You will have different levels of ability within your group, be it if they're you know Man United's first team or they're you know, the, the the Rose and Crown Sunday League team that you, you play with with your friends, everyone's going to have it. So the most skillful people that you've worked with in that space, how have they been able to do that in, in a, a way that, you know, keeps relationships but also helps support the players? Yeah, I think, uh, the best environments I've seen is where the coach has got real intuition and a real knowing of those individuals. Uh, you're not coaching an anonymous group you, you actually understand where those individuals are you'll hear the phrase you meet them where they're at which is you know a sort of commonly used phrase in terms of coaching go to where they are rather than expect them to be where you want them to be and it's it's the coaches who are able to be like a conductor of an orchestra who can just draw the best out of people at the right times give people the right place give people opportunity connect people to each other, um, the environment where if you closed your eyes and listened, what would you hear? Would you hear lots of positive noises, laughing and activity? And if you couldn't hear but could see, what would you see in their behaviours? And those are two of the things that I use in my education work and a couple of videos that I show from my own coaching is that what are you picking up from what's in front of you? And it's the ones who can can identify the changes that are happening in front or the needs of those in front of you. Those are the best coaches. Um, and that is at all that is at all levels. I mean, I would say a fairly uh, abstract example is my daughter's seventh birthday, which was with one of her friends. It was a Harry Potter, but Harry Potter birthday party, 32 kids. Neither me and the other parents wanted to take it on board of, of leading it. We got a party organiser at last minute. He had them in the palm of his hand for two hours. It was enjoyment, constant change of activity, interaction, um, enjoyment, challenges, fun. He just knew how to play that. Um, 
you know, I, I mean, I give you an example from professional football academy I went into watch a couple of years ago, and um, you know, I kind of want to say it, to celebrate it, but I appreciate it may not be the, um, the right thing to do. But my, my feedback to the coach, and I was just watching, I watched an hour and a half uh, of this session in the, in the evening, and I said to him, I couldn't tell whether this was the first minute or the last minute of that session because those children just ran and played and ran and played and got stuck. You know, it was a, it was a masterclass. Sorry, I caught my breath there. No, I think that that's a, a lot of people that I know that work in, in coaching, work in academy coaches will say a lot of the time, I want the kids to run out of the car to the session. Mm. I think that's a really nice thing. You know, if you can say that, for 90 minutes or two hours you can't differentiate between the two because the level of enthusiasm and enjoyment and effort is the same I think that probably shows you that that individual's got a really good uh, grasp of the group in terms of um, your your coach development work is there any particular strategies you use to try and get to know either the, the people in your course quicker or is there any strategies that you think are particularly useful when working with groups to help you just get to know the 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 uh the people in their in their team a little bit better better you know those types of icebreaker activities is there mm. anything that springs to mind yeah I, I would probably give you the the theme really rather than specific activities so uh, you know an example a bit later but i've always found that um play uh, which is kind of one of, one of the areas which coaches may uh, and others may have known me as an area of kind of um, that I work work particularly in is that play is the icebreaker. It's the it's the one that connects people. It's a light hearted touch with an environment that could be people who are not knowing each other. It's it's forgetting what you've come to session with. So if you've had a good day or a bad day, you come to it, you walk into a run where play is the first thing you receive, that light enjoyment, that is the connecting bit. That's a fire starter that I've used this before. You know, that's a film trailer. That's a film trailer that you think, right, I want to know more. I want, you know, it catches people. Look at a film trailer to any um, Bond movie. And, and again, I've used this a few times as an example in the past. You know, if you watch a film trailer to a Bond movie, um, for example, being a James Bond fan, you know, you don't see the whole film, but you want to you want to know what's going to happen. You want the rest. You're hooked. And that's the key is that the, the early activity being reflective of what's to follow. And when you do that with coaches and they experience it, they then they become advocates of it. So, well, that's great. I could do that with my players. I could do it with my team. So it's it's not a curveball. It's not something radically different. It's thinking, let's get the energy up. Let's start with a positive, playful, connecting activity uh, that sets the tone for what's to follow. And uh, there is a random series, you know, I've played. Uh, I mean, I'm going to give you some names of games which are, which are quite, which people want to know more about, but the latest game that I've kind of devised called the tattoo game is possibly one of the funniest connecting activities I've done with a group of coaches. Um, that's a classroom based one, but then the activities outside, anything from sort of, you know, lifeboat games to a number of other activities where you really do um, just project what you firmly believe in. That's the point, you know, is it authentic? Am I doing it because I really believe that this is the right activity for these people? And uh, and that's what I found has been the best way to connect people together and get people started. And what drew you along that path? Because I'd imagine, you know, traditional sports quite often goes down the, the idea of having, you know, a set drill, then, you know, then a practice, then a game at the end or something like that so what drew you to the idea of having play first or as an eye break icebreaker what yeah what was that I guess light bulb moment that went actually I think this is the best way to go and this is what I believe in yeah I, I have often thought about that because you know my dad was a physics teacher so it's, it was uh very sort of scientific and not much whereas I am so different you know 
And either it emerged from me experiencing bad coaching as an as a player, thinking, my God, there's got to be something better than this. Um, having some really great coaching and thinking, I love this, I'd love to be known for this. Um, uh, and a mix of both, really. And then, of course, what happens is the more maverick you become, the more creative you become, the more creative you become and the more maverick you become because it feeds itself, it, it gets success. And then you get such positive feedback from it that you are constantly looking at ways to energize group and be different. You know, I say to my students, uh, don't be a, I won't use this because it probably come back on me, but imagine a, a chain of coffee shops up and down the country or will imagine a coffee group, a chain of coffee shops that are world known. Okay. Shan't name them. I don't want to be that coffee shop. You get the same blend of coffee, whether you're in New York or Birmingham or anywhere. I said, don't be that coffee shop. Be the, be the different one. Be the independent coffee shop on the high street that people know you for who you are, your different blend. Add your unique touch to it. And what I, I believe happens now in, in my students is that after the first year where they ask permission to try new things, by the time they get to second and third year, they are just trying things because they feel comfortable pushing the envelope, trying new ideas, knowing the consequences of them, of those will either be positive and if they're not, then it's about learning. And how do you get them to carry on with that thought process beyond your environment? Because, you know, as you mentioned there, you, you work with them up until the age of maybe 21, if they then go and graduate, I would imagine, having been through the, the coaching circles for the last however many years myself, it would be easy for an individual to have that idea or thought process of going, I'm going to try this, or I want to be flexible here, or let's give that a go, and if it doesn't work, it's fine. But then when you get into a more traditional environment, be it a governing body or you know a high-level organisation, someone saying, we don't do that here, and then it getting the old early on so how do you get them to I guess really have that as part of their identity and accept that you know when they go into these environments that's part of who they are and they're going to do it regardless yeah I mean that, that's a really good really good point because they leave the nurturing or safety of my environment to an area where they may have to conform and you know conforming isn't a bad word but conformity can be quite stifling and they some have said to me, I just can't work here because I come up with these ideas and people say we don't do it like that here. The kids love it, but the other teachers looking across at the coaches saying, well, we need to do it this way. But what happens is they find the environment that, that nourishes them. They find the people around them. They find the coaches who allow them to, or give them permission to try those things. So, you know, eventually they they'll walk into an environment that, again, allows them to flourish. Or over time, when they go into these environments where they've been told they, they can't do this and can't do that, they don't give up. On, uh, they, they Rather than go in and do something really dramatic, they gradually shift things. They gradually turn the dial. They don't go in with 10 out of 10 of creativity innovation. They go in with about 1 out of 10, turn the dial up to 2. And over time success you know is the validator for more the children's feedback the the success don't mean in terms of results but the draw that those children have towards them speaks for itself so that that's really where they carry on that kind of maverick creative different coach but it does happen it does yeah. happen yeah no i can imagine it does and yeah i think as you said what I'm really getting from that is actually probably finding a network of people that allow you to explore. That's quite a big one. Mm. So, you know, having some either senior people that hire you or some, some people that you can bounce things off of consistently allow you to probably keep that flame of light until you're at a point where you can then, like you mentioned there, be, be able to affect change, which is, um, which is obviously a big one. And I really like the analogy around the coffee shop thing, because I think that, um, I did see this on Twitter the other day. Someone said that if everyone 
is, is sterile in the way that coach development has been done, then actually it means that kids that might need different to that don't receive it. Um, I, I what springs to mind is like an Eden Hazard who hated training and what and whatnot. If he'd maybe been in an environment that wasn't so structured, would he have got a bit more out of training or, or or developed in different ways because they would have played into his idea of play and that he wants to just dribble and um, whatnot? So I think that's a real nice analogy. Um, when you look at it from, I guess, a historical perspective, one thing I've noticed over the probably the last 10, 20 years is a shift from... Um, and it still needs to go a bit further, in my opinion, but a shift from maybe more dictatorial type, you're doing this because I tell you, um, to, uh, okay, we're going to try and make you be part of this and get feedback. For example, at Southampton, we do, you know, player feedback uh, during the years, during um, the, their reviews, they have feedback on on how they think things have gone, things they like, things they don't like, um, and opportunities just to hear what they would prefer to do and what what they would like like to work on all of those types of things from you as a as a i guess coach developer and having been in this space for so long have you seen a shift from more dictatorial um to where we are now and how's it been for you working within that space if you have yeah i mean i suppose i'm fortunate because i see lots of different environments one of which is you know I've been I haven't been dragged so I'm not going to use that word. I spent many a time beside of a BMX track, skateboard park. Now it's a downhill mountain bike track, where um, there is no coach. There's uh, you know, there are children learning from children, trying tricks, falling over, getting back up again, and that because that then goes on the, the highest stage of the Olympics when you see that BMX. You know, in terms of tricks, uh, it's not just the race BMX. It's now it's the kind of skate park BMX event that you see. Is where the freedom to express and try things is is led by those athletes. You don't get many coaches. Uh, there are coaches, but that freedom of expression is in that environment, and that's becoming a lot more pervasive across a number of sports. It is filtering down into other sports when you look at cricket you know for example who would have thought that Joe Root would ever start the first ball of a, a test match and he was trying to hit the ball over his head with a scoop shot I mean that would have been unheard of 10 years ago but those environments now are are being reflected in how players perform because they're given that freedom of expression and training and in those what I call co-created environments you know I co-create a teaching environment so we talk about what we want that that environment to look like the co-creation is I say to them how do you want to learn today and and we we create that environment what it's going to look like what it's going to feel like and coaching is the same not all environments like that because I think I I feel sometimes that there's that letting go fear from coaches if I let go of control I will lose I'm kind of disempowering if that's the right word of, of I'm losing this um the power relationship changes. I'm not the all seeing or dancing, but actually, if you co-create, allow freedom of expression, you know what amazing things you get. Um, and the feedback from players and coaches said, "Yeah, we'd like trying that. We want to try this stuff." Ask them what they like to do, what they want to work on. Doesn't mean you're losing control. What it means is you're getting in touch with the needs of those in front of you. What's going to get the best out of them? Who wouldn't ask the, the people that you coach that question of how can I get the best out of you? You, you know, if you go back to an example of gardening, you know, and I'm not a gardener, I'm a failed gardener, but we know that certain plants like certain soil, certain times of year, certain seasons, certain places in the garden. And, you know, it goes back to an example of the cactus and the orchid. You know, one will survive despite and one will thrive because and and if we are sensitive to that environment you'll get some amazing um development of players engagement creativity and obviously i've seen that the bmx one's an interesting one actually because i i saw i think i want to say a skate park in in london that had done a little bit of work on this 
how do you cater for in uh, the, the breadth of individuals there? So what I mean by that is I can imagine having having done similar to this before that you will ask that question and then maybe the most uh, socially confident individual kind of straight away goes, oh, this is what we want to do. Or there's a level of conformity in the group of if you send them away, the socially one with the highest standing comes says, oh, I want to do this and everyone goes along with it because they want to like the best player or they want to be the, with the most popular kid and whatnot. So mm. how do you manage that dynamic to ensure that actually you're catering for the breadth of the group and not just for one or two really, really confident individuals? Because you create an environment where that voice isn't the only voice, where people feel they are able to speak out and, and offer their opinions. That, that takes time, you know, it's the oxygen stealers are the ones who are always in front of you, demanding to be heard, demanded to be seen, um, and goes back to noticing, you, you know, spread your questions not to that person all the time, offer that question to everybody. Um, the person who is quiet may not give you the answer in front of everybody, but they'll still talk to you, and they'll talk to you, either not in words, but in actions. Um and it goes back to the environment that you create. It's the permission environment where people feel they can communicate to you and be heard. You know, it, sometimes it's it's a challenge. Think, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Okay, well, well maybe we could do that. Um, and, you know, time allows that relationship, which we spoke about at the beginning, to become deeper. Um, the, the, I remember listening to... Um, a podcast and and it was it is related to what I'm just saying is where this this guy on, who was invited on this said he he teaches people to, to speak in public he also teaches people how to listen and he said he sells out the how to talk in public five times more than how to listen you know and it actually the art of listening and then deep listening is a real skill um are we listening to what the group is telling us um, are we providing everybody an opportunity to give their opinion? Um, and I, I'm not saying that that is always going to happen, but from my experience, giving people that environment means you don't always get the same voice kind of, you know, knocking the door with, with it. This is what we want. And I'd imagine from you being around this, that actually the more that you enable this type of discussion, it then means if you do at some point decide to have an intervention or, or go in and provide a coaching point, the engagement with it is increased because they know that it's not unnecessary noise and that actually mm. it, it's going to add value to the scenario they're already in or something that they're trying, you're trying to support them with an endeavour that they have. Yeah, if, if you co-create something, if you form a partnership, a learning partnership, then you kind of, succeed together you know and if you make mistakes and you're all you all make mistakes it's it's when you impose something on people that that is the problem um and why not ask people's opinions why not ask their ideas you could be missing a trick you know i took a group of students it's a long time ago now but i still remember this example where someone had two minute exercise and there's a new lad to the group um and uh they just, uh, they were trying to solve this problem and they ignored him for pretty much uh, 20 minutes and they got, you know, didn't really know him very well, didn't introduce themselves to him. And um, I said, have you asked, asked this uh, lad his opinion? And they said, no, we haven't. I said, do you know what he does? I said, no. Well, he was a balloonist, okay? So he was used to tying ropes and knots and everything, but they'd never asked him. They never actually found the skills within the group. They marginalised him. And then when they found out what he did, it just completely changed everything. It changed their perception of him. Um, and we don't want to leave people on the fringes of a group because everybody can offer something. And it's creating an environment where people feel they can do that. And I'm constantly surprised by what students say to me in terms of how they want to learn. But open to it. Have you got any particular examples of that? Yeah, um, I said to them the other day, I said, they were doing presentations, and um, I said, uh, 
they, I said, we don't like standing in front of people. I said, well, I'm not interested in you. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I'm interested in what you've got to tell me, what you've got to show me. We're not. And then they, uh, then the week after, when they came to these presentations, they had brought the widest range of interactive ideas for a presentation that I've seen. Because they wanted to show me that they had learned how to present, how to engage, how to think differently, and how to be curious. Um, so, you know, I mean, we built an indoor parkour circuit at the university. So one of those projects was fundamental movement skills. So we got all the kit out of the gym, put it in the sports, and said, right, build a parkour circuit. And um, they brought these dumbbell discs out. Uh, 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 sorry, barbell discs out. I looked at him and they brought a hurdle out and I was thinking, oh, it's, where's this going? Now the discs were to go under your heels for a takeoff. They're also there as markers for landing. And the hurdle that I never thought they'd jump over, they went, no, Rich, it's not going to jump over, it's about crawling through it. And that freedom to create this parkour circuit came from me thinking initially, that's never going to work. And then it, it was amazing. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a really nice example and giving giving um people opportunity just, just to explore. And I like what you said there around the, the presentation bit because I imagine that, that that does change someone's outlook into how they view presentations, particularly if you're getting a little bit nervous around it. Um I guess one one perception that, that I have of younger children at the, at, yeah at the moment I guess generationally is that they probably don't spend as much time outside as they used to um, particularly of the, having those just play opportunities to go with your friends down the park and climb or, or play football or play rugby and whatnot from your experience ha have you seen that trend and has that um challenged your work within this area of them having i guess some level of understanding of, of games they're able to play or ideas that they're able to then bounce off yeah i mean i think that's a that's a really great conversation point and 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 critical as well because there's so many variables involved you know there's the kind of no balls games concept really i live in a town that is comfortable with no ball games. Um, you know, urbanisation has restricted some free, free spontaneous play spaces. Um, I think we're fearful of letting children go out into not spontaneous play space because of traffic and hazards that face them. So, also the formalised games that are no, are no longer the activities that children want to want to do now you know um we go to a place called alton um which is just down the road from us and when they sold the football ground for um uh for housing and then built a new football ground they put a, a little bike pump track and a skate park next to it and you know it's a great thing because um they're understanding what children's play spaces are like now I still think there are real challenges around um, listening to the youth voice. You know, I think there's a generational divide between young people and older people who weren't, who aren't the aren't of the generation now. You know, my daughter's free space, as I said to you before, she's building out bike, mountain bike tracks in the local woods and the local land, and has just bulldozed it. Um, that sets us challenges now where she's going to ride. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges with children in terms of, you know, people, you hear this, well, they're stuck behind the computer all day. I don't think that's entirely true. I, I generally don't think it is. I think children crave free play. They crave space to play. And that's the challenge is to provide them that free space, informal opportunity for them to play. And do you think, do you think that that's partly down to the level of formalized activities that young young people young children do so i think 
from from you know what what you're describing here um in in like an academic sense to a degree it resonates with me in terms of at school you're, pro- you're probably given some boundaries that you have to work between and within and that actually there isn't maybe an opportunity for exploration of topics or ideas it's more of a you have to learn this in mm. this way then you transfer that between primary school and secondary school and college and university potentially because whilst you know my university experience was good it probably wasn't as free play as, as you're discussing you combine that then maybe with you know youth sport or music or art which might be very session plan heavy for whatever whatever reason because of governing bodies or justifying financial output from parents etc it seems like everything is very formalized in the way that it, that it looks and works for children so do you think it's a, i guess a wider cultural issue of that actually there is very little opportunity for them to just not try and cure their own boredom and go and explore what their environment looks like yeah i think um and again this is just some observations some experiences um those those free play opportunities are stifled that spontaneous play is restricted you know i say to anybody go to those spaces go to a skateboard park go to bmx track um that used to be probably regarded as a place where the hoons hung out, you know, the troublemakers hang out, but actually go to skateboard park. Kids are being kids in their own time, internally driven by what's important to them, working with their peers, learning from their peers, turning up in all weathers. How do you recreate that in a coaching environment? Because that's the benchmark. The benchmark is set by the kids turning up all weathers to something where they don't stop for minute one to minute 90 or whenever they finish where they are curious about learning, like challenges, feel part of a group. There's the hierarchy is not evident um, and they'll come back week after week. Now, how do we create that? That's the challenge as a coach because kids are doing it pretty well by themselves when they're allowed to. I'm not saying that we should move away from formal sports at all. I'm just saying that if they're going to do those traditional formal sports settings, that's those are the ingredients that will keep children involved. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess from my perspective, it resonates with my thought. I actually think that it's partly with schooling as well, in my opinion. I think that actually if you taught people how to learn and made it where they just loved learning stuff, you would probably end up with a lot of, curious individuals over over a generation Mm. rather than teaching them to learn specific stuff which they may not find of any use or no interest or they might not want to learn about the Tudors because they don't think it's going to have any addition to their life whereas actually if you made it where they were really enthused by, by the idea of learning and they picked out part of the Tudors there was something that was interesting be it animals if it's someone that's into animals or armor for those who are into armor I think the the skill of being curious is probably something that across the board is maybe something that's being stifled which then presents challenges in terms of the way people access sport or activity and then on a if you want to go really uh, performance specific it probably stifles individuals in terms of the way they look to solve problems uh at a performance basis which is why people like your danny cipriani's or your kevin peterson's etc stand out so much because they have that curiosity able to react in chaos play type of notion rather than it being i've been told to put the ball from x to z and that's what i'm going to do yeah, I think you go back to the Cipriani example, you know, um, one exceptional player who, you know, was the X factor. It was a real game changer. I mean, who wants to play against anybody who's got the X factor? Who wants to be in the team that's facing Kevin Peterson, Ben Stokes, Cipriani, uh, these X factor players that, you know, are very difficult to to compete against and you know you mentioned about the curiosity and um 
the love of learning. And those are the, the things which drive us all. Um, and, and when you go back to, um, I mean, I've just been wa- watching a film called The Deepest Breath. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's on Netflix about free diving. Yeah, my wife's telling me to watch it. It's on my, yeah. another one on my uh, to hit list, that one. You know, it's representative of someone who's got curiosity about that that sport, such they become immersed into it. They seek the next challenge. They seek the next environment. They seek to go deeper, seek to go further, seek greater challenges. How can we create an environment where that is the sport that we want them to be, you know, good at, want them to to thrive in? Um, and you know, it's interesting about formal education because, you know, watching it at the moment from the sidelines, it's difficult because I know what drives my daughter. I know how she's curious, but she's not curious about the topics that she's been taught. Um, it's not criticism in the school, but they're just a bit dry. They're not related to uh, her life, you know, not related to what she wants to do. Um, and I want people to be curious. I don't. I say to the students, I say, I don't care what it is. Just be passionate about something. Find something that you know makes you want to follow that up. You know, and I say things like it's the box set example, and they say, "What do you mean by that?" I said, "Have you ever watched a box set one at a time?" And they said, "No, we haven't. We watched it all in one go because we couldn't wait for the next episode." That's the kind of thing that you're so curious about something you can't wait for the next bit. And, you know, create environments where people are challenged, um, engaged, you know, and I think that's, that is the future. The future of learning is making it relatable, making it engaging, making it co-created, making it something that people are curious about. You know, player-led, child-led doesn't mean you lose your control. It's about, they are you're finding what is nourishing them, what is um, the best thing for them. I think that's a really nice way to finish this conversation. So I've got one last question for you because I'm conscious of time, which is if I were to speak to the, the young people that you, you work with, how would you hope they described you in three words and why? Breaks the rules. <laughs> there you go perfect well a very nice way to finish the conversation this and richard really appreciate your time um i think a fascinating conversation and definitely plenty more for us to divulge into again so maybe what another one of these might be due further down the line but yeah really appreciate your time and enjoy your summer holidays thanks very much bye-bye Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.